Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on enhancing food safety management, streamlining ingredient and raw material, monitoring and assessing emerging risks for your ingredients and suppliers. In an era where unprecedented risks from geopolitical tensions to climate change are impacting global supply chains, ensuring the safety and quality of ingredients is more critical than ever. We hear loud and clear from the industry, as well as our long-standing partners, that the challenge of constantly having to consider additional factors to monitor their supply chain to stay ahead of the curve. We understand the food and beverage companies face the dual challenge of preventing both financial as well as reputational and brand damage from costly recalls or large-scale outbreaks while also managing an ever-evolving landscape of high risks and hazards. Today, we will explore the challenges that food manufacturers face from a reactive to a proactive stance on the food safety industry. We will cover the common practices and companies and partners employed today, their expectations, their limitations, and how they can approach and streamline their food safety processes to save time and effort, as well as making them more efficient for everyone. What are the main focus? What is the main focus for today's webinar? Uh, we will speak and we'll focus on four key areas for food safety, food safety management, specifically risk monitoring and assessment for ingredients, products, and suppliers. Has planning a risk management for your supply chain, reporting a risk tracking on your top ingredients and hazards, as well as proactive food safety strategy and how it can be incorporated into your daily workflows for optimum results. I'm Marina Bivsa, I'm the Head of Customer Success at Agrono, and with the help of Michalis, we are going to discuss several use cases from partners and the industry focused on AI and the role it can play in the risk assessment and has planning. Michal, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Definitely, and thanks Marina. Happy being here as well. My name is Michalis, the huge word following my name is my last name. So I'm Michal Rovosadino with a background in computer science. And within Agrono, I've been with Agrono for the past roughly nine years now, working as a data engineer and also leading our data team. Thank you, Michalis. And now let's dive deeper into the challenges faced by food, by food and beverage companies and the strategies they adopt to overcome these obstacles. Common practices in the industry. When it comes to assessing the risk for the ingredients and products, food and beverage companies are increasingly worried about the impact of unexpected risks in their supply chain. The rising cost of recalls, the looming threat of global supply chain disruptions due to geopolitical unrest, as well as the environmental impact of climate change, have all underscored the need for constant oversight of new and existing risks. This dynamic landscape necessitates a proactive approach to food safety management. To mitigate these risks, many food and beverage companies have established comprehensive food safety processes, such as hazard analysis uh, plans, as well as critical control point plans that enable them to respond quickly to incidents and identify emerging risks. What are some common practices we see in risk monitoring? Regularly monitor at least two to three official food safety uh, sources like RAFs or the FDA uh, for relevant incidents. The, there are several cases where partners monitor multiple sources based on the region they'd like to cover or the city or to investigate further a specific incident report. Systematically search online for sources and sites for emerging issues and hazards affecting the supply chain. In a constant effort to expand that coverage in all regions of interest, especially the ones where there are not many official food safety authority sources available, as well as utilizing a third party uh, horizon scanning service to receive alerts and notifications about relevant instances in their supply chain. What are some common practices we see in risk assessment? We see that partners hold regularly scheduled meetings on a weekly, monthly, or quarterly basis 
where experienced team members discuss priority risks as well as next steps and actions they need to take. Use a periodically updated spreadsheet that calculates risk scores for ingredients or suppliers based on various data inputs, as well as develop ongoing reports on a regular basis for ingredients and suppliers in their supply chain to assess high risk threats. What are some common practices we see in risk prevention? Regularly revisit and revise risk prevention measures to ensure they're always up to date. Follow a systematic process to interact with external experts and the market to identify emerging risks and prioritize actions. Constantly monitoring high-risk ingredients and emerging hazards to take the appropriate measures, testing, and to stay ahead of the curve. To ensure the effectiveness of their house plants, food and beverage companies typically conduct audits of suppliers and factory premises to ensure compliance, review raw materials and conduct, conduct quality checks, track deviations or mismatches in raw material delivery. They also perform trend analysis of critical control points for certain ingredients across different regions. They reassess and modify the hash plan whenever there is a change in the processing work, in the processing flow, and engage dedicated personnel to verify hash plans and benchmark against other companies' practices. The challenge is is complex and it's an evolving uh, risk landscape. The task of monitoring and assessing risks across a diverse range of ingredients, suppliers and manufacturing locations in order to prevent and mitigate risks remains daunting due to several factors. First of all, volume and variety of ingredients. The increasing number of ingredients and products that must be monitored and assessed each with its unique set of risks can overwhelm existing processes. Diverse requirements across regions can be tricky. Different manufacturing plants and regions may require unique ingredients and suppliers, further complicating the risk monitoring and assessment process. And thirdly, reactive versus proactive manage management. Many companies still re rely on reactive measures, such as responding uh, to instance after the fact, rather than anticipating and be prepared for them. The challenges are constant and many, and we are here with Michalis's help and expertise to show you simple use cases for monitoring and assessing risk through Fudakai. Michali, over to you. Great. Thanks, Marina, for the introductory part. So, as Marina mentioned, what we're about to do is we have identified four specific use cases we're going to use in order to showcase the power of data and predictive analytics in order to perform risk assessment and potentially update your hash plans internally. Since we said the word data and the personal favorite quote of mine, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. This is something that we try to depict in this slide as well. What you are seeing here is the overview, the data overview, we have at least internally in our database within Agronome. In a nutshell, no, no reason to go through the details here. Keep in mind that the data analytics and predictive analytics you're about to see in the following use cases basically take advantage of these roughly 1.2 billion data records we have at our disposal. Now, let's start with the actual use cases. Marina, we can move on to the next slide. So, for these use cases we're about to see, let's assume we're a manufacturer working in the herbs and spices industry with hundreds, potentially thousands of ingredients. And we want to be able, out of all of the ingredients within the food, within the food industry, we want to first be able to isolate the ones that are of interest to us. So we need a place to say that, okay, I'm interested in only cinnamon, cumin, basil, and whatever else ingredient, and be able to identify out of all of the hundreds or thousands of ingredients at your supply chain, which are the ones that are showing an increasing tendency. Let's spend a moment here to discuss a bit about tendency. 
For us, in the screenshot you are seeing, tendency basically is a comparison of the past 12 months of data. So how many food recalls and border rejections have taken place for cinnamon over the past 12 months. And if we compare this number with the 12 months before, for any ingredient, any product that is showing an increasing tendency, we're isolating here, we're isolating it here in this screenshot. Basically, you can use such initial data analysis to identify the ingredients that are showing an out of the ordinary behavior, statistical behavior in terms of total number of recalls. However, of course, as I'm sure much of the audience is more aware to this, to this than I am, you are potentially not interested in every geography for all of your ingredients out there. So if we move on to the next slide, let's try to dive in deeper a bit into the data. So you are sourcing your cumin from around the world and potentially there are a number of hazards that may be affecting your ingredients, such as cumin that's highlighted here. In this slide, what you can do using historical data is that you, you can perform risk assessment for these ingredients and identify the hazards, the reasons behind potential recalls that have affected them over the past years and are showing either an increasing tendency or are very, very new. In this way, basically, in, in a quick way, you can easily identify hazards and check, and check them against your hash plan so that to make sure that you are including them and or paying enough attention to them. And this is it as far as use case one goes. Marina, if we can move on to the next slide. Now, let's try to make the analysis a bit more detailed. So up until now, we have isolated out of all of the ingredients in our supply chain, which are the ones that are showing an out of the ordinary increase, which are the hazards that are either emerging or are increasing. Now let's take into account our sourcing geographies. So in this slide we're seeing here, out of all of how we're showing, how are the recalls and border rejections for cumin spread based on the country of origin the cumin was, cal was cultivated. In this way, of course, multiple data records are used in this analysis, but basically uh, you can use this kind of data analytics to identify regions that have a higher incident count and may potentially affect your own supply chain given where you're sourcing your ingredients from. And not only that, if we move on to the next slide, we can even perform a risk assessment based on the specific geographies, the specific regions around the world we are getting our cumin from. In this example we have highlighted here, we are performing risk assessment for cumin, however, specifically sourced from either India or Turkey. You can see the analysis in this slide, so there are highlights in terms of pesticides that were found, and another active substance there. You can study, of course, the tendency, the actual data behind it and compare it between the two. The important thing to keep in mind, since we're talking about risk assessment, at least as performed within Fudakai, is that this is the result of the formula we have internally in our system. Basically, it's a hash-based approach that takes into account the hazard severity, how severe is a specific hazard to human health, as well as probability, how often does chlorpyrifos happen in cumin when it is sourced, it's cultivated from India and Turkey. So using, using this kind of risk assessment analysis, basically you can perform a very custom, a very detailed and in-depth analysis based again on your own internal supply chain. This is as far as use case goes, use case two goes. Now let's switch to use case three. For the third use case, we try to dive in deeper a bit into the actual supply chain as far as suppliers, food companies that one food company is working with. And in this slide, we're showing the risk assessment performed for two distinct suppliers. Of course, one can have multiple in their system. And the important thing here is that one could combine external data, publicly available data, such as the one that food guy is collecting and analyzing. This is highlighted uh, in blue in this slide. Integrate their own potential internal data into the mix, such as the highlighted audit score here, but of course it can be your internal lab tests. Basically, any kind of numerical 
uh, data that you have internally at your disposal that you want to take into account to combine with externally available, available data records in order to perform supplier risk assessment using the combination of the two data. In this specific web sli uh, slide we're seeing here, we are using this combination of data along with a weighted approach for each of the numerical values we are seeing for each row in this table in order to perform the supplier risk assessment and calculate the overall risk score, thus being able to rank our suppliers from a risk assessment perspective and obviously potentially spend more time testing, auditing the ones that are seen to be on the rise. Apart from that, of course, you can dive in deeper into the suppliers. So Marina, if we move on to the next slide, if for any supplier you would like to perform a deeper analysis based on either your internal data or the publicly available ones, such as the ones depicted in this slide here, of course, you can, view, you can view this supplier profile page, basically a page, a place within at least our system where the aggregated information for any supplier exists. By aggregated, we're talking about a, the simulation of all of their hierarchy, all of the company hierarchy involving potentially parent companies, subsidiary companies, alternative names. So if we focus on the top part of the screenshot on the left side of, your, of the slide, which, how many inspections have taken place for supplier A and all of, the, all of their hierarchy? 14 inspections producing some kind of actionable outcome. How many recalls have taken place on a national level involving either supplier A and or their subsidiaries and or their parent organizations? Same goes for border rejections and warning letters. This is, again, top-level analysis. But if we want to dive in deeper into the data and specify filter based on our own supply chain, of course, one can always specify which are the ingredients that they are sourcing from this specific supply array, such as the lowest side on, on the screen on the left, and perform a risk assessment specifically for this ingredient so that, that one could easily identify which are the hazards they should be checking against uh, for this specific supplier. So in this case, for instance, out of all of the ingredients we are sourcing from supplier A, uh, the appearance of pesticides in chili peppers seems to be quite high, but also the potential of heavy metals in cinnamon also scores a medium risk. And that is it for the supply performance monitoring use case. Marina, again, if we could move on to the next slide. Now, before we dive into this fourth use case, all of the previous three ones we have seen take advantage of the historical data available out there, publicly available historical data, and we have performed an analysis based on this data to identify ingredients that are showing an increasing tendency, hazards that uh, are affecting more the ingredients of one supply chain as opposed to others. We have dived, dived in deeper into specific geographies that potentially showcase problems for these ingredients and study the supplier performance. All of these uh, performance metrics and analytics we've done is based on historical data. Now, in this fourth use case, we are trying to move 12 months into the future. So we attempt to, uh, to utilize predictive analytics, utilize all of the historical data at our disposal, and attempt to identify what will take place for a specific ingredient, a combination of a specific ingredient being sourced from a specific geography, or being involved in a recall for a specific hazard over the next 12 months. In this slide we're seeing here, and just a quick legend on that, so strong blue line is historical data, so how many incidents have taken place for herbs and spices in this case over the past years. A red line is what do our most accurate models believe will take place over the next 12 months uh, on a monthly basis. And the green line is, is a quite interesting one because it takes into account the trend, the tendency, whether it's, it's expected to go up or down for a specific ingredient over the next year. Basically, you can use such analytics to either dive in deeper into the data and, say, and attempt to use them in order to predict what will take place on a monthly level in terms of total number of incidents, or utilize the trend value 
And if, for instance, it's expected to be on the rise over the next six months, then potentially update your internal uh, hash plan or whatever strategy you have for audits and tests in order to heavier test these, these ingredients as opposed to others that are showing a decreasing tendency. Of course, just for reference uh, purposes, keep in mind that at least within our system, um, the trend analysis is done on a, on a six month interval, 12 month interval, and 18, an 18 month interval. And now, moving on to the next slide, Marina. Again, as we did for the previous use cases, let's attempt to dive in deeper into the data. What we saw before is the top level analysis for the expected incidence for herbs and spices and their trend over the next 12 months. However, if we focus on the left side of the slide, out of all of the hazards, all of the reasons behind the recalls for herbs and spices over the past years, which hazards are the ones that are expected to be on the rise over the next 12 months? Keep in mind that for every line you are seeing in this table on the left, a different AI model is trained in order to produce the output. And the important thing to keep in mind here is that this way you can easily identify which are the ones that are expected to be on the rise. So obviously update your internal hash plan accordingly. And if you see if there are some outliers, some very big numbers here in the trend value and the expected incidents over the next 12 months, you can use this guys these kinds of insights in order to identify hazards that are very, very new, that are out of the ordinary, that are outliers, and again, update your internal plans accordingly. This is one side of the story, the, the left part of this slide. Of course, a similar kind of predictive analysis, analytics can be done from a country of origin point of view. So herbs and spices are pretty much calculated all around the world. Which are the geographies, the countries, or potentially the continents? that are expected to have a rise in terms of total number of incidents over the next 12 months. This is what's depicted on the right. Of course, darker, yeah, darker red color means more expected incidents as opposed to a lighter red color. And this is it for the fourth use case. Let's switch our, yeah. Thank you, Michali. Thank you so much uh, for walking us through all the use cases. Uh, as you have seen, most likely there is a Q&A uh, chat uh, here, so feel free to drop all your questions. I do think I saw one already. Uh, let me just check. Uh, there are a number of them. Marina, if you want, I can start on that. I have them in front of me. Uh, so let's start with the first one. What do you consider as new risk in risk assessment tool? If you don't mind, Marina, I can take this one. Sure. So uh, my guess is that whoever asked this referred to the to use case one, where some of the lines of the increasing and emerging risks were highlighted as new. So for us, a new hazard is based on the approach we have for risk assessment just to give a short, in, a short intro before we actually dive into the answer. So we have at our disposal food safety related data roughly going back 40 years. However, for risk assessment, we are using specific periods of time in order to perform the risk assessment. This can be of course customized, but it can vary from three to 10 years of data. So for us, a new hazard is the one that has taken place for the first time over the period we are using to perform risk assessment, let's assume seven years of data, as opposed to the roughly 40 we have data on. So if something happened for the first time in seven years and never before in the past 33, it will be considered a new hazard. Thank you, Michale. And I see one which I can take. Uh, is training provided for the tool? Uh, I can I can answer that one uh, as uh, the customer success team is uh, responsible to be able to take care of those trainings for uh, anyone joining the platform. So we have several materials that we provide our partners with, starting from specific step by step guides where they can we can walk them through each module and its capability on the platform uh, so they can share that with their teams. Uh, we follow with specific uh, demo videos uh, per module, uh, so that's also really helpful to have on hand. 
uh, and helps with the deployment of the platform across all your teams. And finally, we do provide group training demos as well as one-to-one -one training demos, depending on uh, availability resources, as well as the subscription uh, a partner might have. So there's several tools there to deploy these types of platforms into your workflows, and uh, we make sure that we are there to support uh, in any way we can. Perfect. Thanks, Marina. I see another one in the Q&A section. I can take partially this answer, but if you want, Marina, you can dive in. So, and Adent is asking, how easy is it to deploy such a solution into a company's workflows? Now, if I may start, Marina, and then, of course, feel free to chip in. Sure. So, actually, utilizing such a system is... I would say initially very straightforward. So basically what we just presented for Futokai, but of course there are other similar solutions out there. This is a web application. You can access it using an internet connection, a username and password, and take advantage of the data analytics, risk assessment, and or predictive analytics offered by such a tool. So using the output of the charts, the analysis, and or reporting offered by such a tool, you can export the data, for instance, and involve it in your internal work workflows. This is one side that one could use such a system to integrate in their own internal workflows. So from Fudakai, for instance, to the internal workflows. However, and this is straightforward, another way one could use that is by integrating their own internal data into Fudakai and then taking advantage of the analytics, as risk assessment and predictive analytics by combining the two different data sets. This is another way, of course, it's more challenging because there are a number of at least technical aspects that are involved in such a decision. However, in our opinion, this is the way that one could get the most out of such a data system. Thank you, Michalis. I think you answered it perfectly. The only thing I could add from a, more of a, a from a, our side, from our perspective, is that a deployment can take some time and effort on both ends, and it's some time for adoption across all teams. Uh, we are there uh, as a team on our end to support in that process uh, through several routines, uh, materials, uh, in order to deploy such a platform uh, carefully, gradually and effectively throughout different teams and departments, uh, whether that's food safety, quality uh, or any others that might use the platform like we've seen historically. So it, it kind of works both ways on that, on that end. Great. And thanks, Marina. There's also another question in the Q&A. How are data harmonized in the platform? If you don't mind, Marina, I can take this one. I will be honest, it's a personal favorite of mine regardless. So I, as I'm sure the attendee asking is a bit aware of the data problem we are trying to tackle using Fudakai. So basically, this 1.2 billion data records that we saw initially in the data slide, Basically, the, the way that these are collected is through the websites of food safety authorities around the world. So needless to say that this data may be in different formats, such as PDF, a web page, um, Excel files, in the national language of the country the food safety authority is based in. So obviously, it would make our life way easier if everything was in English. Unfortunately, it's not. So the initial issue of collecting has to do involves heavily involves this harmonization step mentioned in this question so what we do is that we collect the raw data in the official language and format as announced by food by the food safety authority and then using a semi-automatic approach first the system attempts to identify the recalled ingredient hazard food company involved in the announcement we mentioned semi-automatic this is the automatic part the semi is due to the fact that there are food scientists, food safety experts internally in our team, specifically in data, in our data team, that are reviewing the data we collect and potentially uh, changing them if the machine was not able to perform an accurate extraction, an accurate annotation. And only after the data have been validated by a human expert are made available in Foodakai and our data as a service solution. Thank you, Michalis. And I see another question on uh, what kind of, what type of data sources do we cover? 
Uh, I can take that one. Of course, you can, you know, uh, expand on it. Uh, we cover more than uh, 60 for food safety authorities worldwide. Uh, and as, of course, Michal has mentioned, we curate all that information in English, so it's harmonized on the platform. That being said, uh, we work closely with our partners, so if there are certain uh, data sources that they cover from very specific or isolated regions, something that's of importance to them, we always take that in with Michal's team investigated, and if there is uh, for us a way to track that information into the system, we always make sure to add more sources to expand the coverage worldwide especially in areas with restricted uh, uh, food safety, Office of Safety Authorities. Yeah. And if I may add a bit on this, Marina, what you described, of course, is perfectly correct. This has to do with the Food Safety Authorities data we're collecting, so food recalls and border rejections. Apart from that, I, of course, there are other data types that are important when performing a food safety analysis. So, for instance, inspection data, warning letters, food safety related news items, potentially legislation pieces may affect uh, one's food safety analysis. And apart from that, there are other data types that we cover mostly utilized in our forecasting approaches. And these other data types I'm referring to are production data, price data, uh, potentially weather data, all of these data records that affect one way or another uh, the food safety profile of a specific ingredient or used in our forecasting approaches are amongst the data we collect, analyze, and cover in Foodakai and our API solution. Amazing. Uh, and I see one more uh, regarding the alerting system and how it works. Uh, I can take that in, and of course, you know, you can pitch in as well, Michalis. Uh, so basically, the way the platform works is that everyone, every user or every organization uh, can have their own alerting system set up, uh, which means that they can be uh, immediately alerted regarding ingredients and suppliers in their, supp in their supply chain anytime there is a publicly instant report. Uh, it works in a different ways with different filters and options. Uh, you can choose specific hazards, specific ingredients, specific regions you'd like to cover. Uh, there's lots of different options there depending uh, on the needs, uh, depending on the business units. Uh, and those are emailed to you directly into your inbox. So you are uh, aware of what's happening right away uh, and anything that you might need to be alerted about. Uh, regarding any of your ingredients or your uh, suppliers. See anything else here? Any other questions? I do not see any other in the Q&A or functionality. Perfect, so we can proceed. And of course, you can. You are more than welcome to email us any questions or any follow-ups after the webinar. We'd be happy to answer them. Uh, thank you for joining the webinar. And also thank you for uh, replying to our survey earlier on, which was shared from our team. Uh, if uh, can we trust new technologies and AI in food risk prevention? 71% of you replied that they would use such a platform to early identify emerging unexpected risks so they can include them in their risk mitigation. Thank you so much for participating. Uh, you can learn more about Fudakai and the way it works by scanning the QR code here uh, and we'll be able to book a demo and have a further discussion. Uh, and this concludes our webinar for today. Thank you, Michalis. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks, everyone. Bye.